Let me organize my monitor with my slides here. So uh, thank you for joining the Polycon UK webinar. Um, uh, today we have Laurent Bouton from Georgetown, who is going to present electoral systems and inequalities in government interventions. This is joint work with Governance Genico and Mikael Castaneda. Uh, before I hand over to Laurent, let me remind you that these webinars take place every two weeks on Mondays at 3 p.m. UK time. In two weeks, uh, we will have with us Monica Martinez Bravo from SEMFI. <laughs> As usual, you can find more information about the coming list of speakers and past seminars on our website. We also encourage you to follow us on Twitter and watch past talks on our YouTube channel. Uh, the format of the seminar is, is standard. We have 50 minute presentation and that is going to be followed by a 10 minute discussion and questions. We request all attendees to keep your microphones muted and cameras turned off, but you can ask questions via chat and please do so. We'll also leave comments. Um, moderators may put forward some clarifying questions to the speaker, but uh, we will keep the remaining questions uh, until the Q&A questions at the end and you'll be able to ask in person. After the Q&A, that is at the top of the hour, we will finish uh, the official part of the seminar and we will stop recording. The recording is on. Uh, but uh, please uh, stay after that official part. Uh, we are going to hang out for a few minutes. Uh, we can chat informally about the talk, but other things as well. All right, uh, Laurent, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Um, the screen is yours. All right, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here, uh, to be here, to be on the screen. Um, so just uh, in case you don't know, these are, uh, means that we randomized the, the uh, names of authors and not that, you know, it's not that I didn't do anything on this paper. Um, all right, so, um, so let me start so the, with the motivation. So, you know, I don't think I have to um, convince you that um, when you look at government interventions uh, around the world, you see very substantial ine geographic inequalities, uh, both in terms of quantity and quality of public goods and services, uh, and in terms of um, taxation. And um, there is a, a large uh, literature, the distributive politics literature, uh, that uh, try to understand how um, political factors affect um, these inequalities, okay, so are determinants for these uh, inequalities in government interventions, and they identify many factors as uh, as key. Okay, you can think about you know the apportionment of malapportionment of electoral district, the contestability, uh, some characteristics characteristics of voters such as uh, you know their turnout rate, uh, the information they have, and so on. All right, and that literature, um, you know, the, the main find the findings suggest that overall political distortions are uh, quite substantial. All right, so what we do in this paper is, so, you know, we really, this paper fits in that, uh, in that literature. We are trying to understand the determinants of inequalities in government interventions uh, with a special focus on um, the role of electoral systems. And in particular, we are going to uh, compare majoritarian systems, which I'm going to call MAJ all the time, and proportional representation system, uh, which I'm going to call uh, PR. Right, so just to be sure, uh, probably not useful in this crowd, but just to make sure um, that we uh, talk about the same thing. What we mean by majoritarian systems um, are systems in which there are uh, many electoral districts. Um, each of them is associated to a limited number of representatives, all right? And the most accurate version be, uh, being only one uh, representative per district. And um, the party winning the seat associated to a district is just the party that obtains, you know, it's a winner take all method. So let's say the party that obtains the largest number of votes in that district or something similar to that. By contrast, in a proportional representation systems, um, the number of districts is uh, smaller, all right? And the, in the extreme version, you would have only one nationwide electoral district. Um, each of these districts is going to select at least two representatives and often many more than that. Um, and then the seats of a district are assigned in proportion to the vouchers of uh, each party, All right? And so in the extreme version, which is the one we are going to like consider in the baseline model, at least of PR system, you have one nationwide district, which a number of seats, which is the total number of seats in the national assembly and a party winning 55% of the votes in that, uh, in the country, in the election would get 55% of, of the seats, All right? So that's, those are the systems. So these are, um, you know, widely used systems 
uh, around the world. So just uh, one fact, one you know, key f like interesting fact, let's say is that 82% of legislative elections held in the 2000s used either majority systems or PR system, all right? Um, there are frequent debates about which system to use. Obviously, you know, most of the time at the time to, uh, of transition to democracies, all right? But it's also, also in uh, older democracies, uh, you see that reforms are relatively frequent, all right? Um, and <clears throat> Um, what I want to stress is that our results are also going to be relevant for um, reform, like for potential reforms of the electoral, the U.S. Electoral College, uh, toward, for instance, a national and popular vote, because this is a majoritarian system and this is equivalent to a proportional representation system. So I'm going to talk more uh, about that in the last part of the talk. Um, okay, so obviously. Uh, we are not the first one <laughs> to uh, uh, study the, the, the role of uh, electoral system in um, um, determining government intervention and inequalities in government interventions. Um, and so the conventional wisdom here, which, you know, all reading of the literature at least, is that uh, mass systems are in general more conducive to inequality uh, in government interventions than a PR system. And the, 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 the essential reason is that the, um, the mass systems provide steeper incentives uh, to parties to target government intervention to specific groups uh, in the country. And there are various uh, theories, all right, theoretical arguments here. One that um, I like a lot is by Lidarian Persico, which is this, the so-called 50% of 50% argument, which is in a proportional representation system, to win, you need to win, uh, to win a majority in the National Assembly, a majority of seats in the National Assembly, you need 50% um, of the vote, uh, more than 50% of the vote, all right, a majority of the vote in the country, right? So you need to essentially convince at least 50% of the voters to vote for you. Under MASH, the situation is different because what you need is to win 50% of the districts, right? In a sing single member district system, 50% of the district, which requires you to obtain 50% of the votes in 50% of those districts, which is, you know, essentially 25% of the votes. And so, and so now, the, so you have incentives to target only like a much smaller fraction of the population in order to win a majority in the National Assembly. Right, so that's that's one type of argument. Another one is, you know, the idea of battleground states that, or districts, that some districts have a chance to uh, are likely to move from uh, one party to the others, so, and others are not. So you have incentive to target those districts that are likely to uh, to swing. Um, and there are also theories based on tensions between party leaders and regional uh, legislator in in majoritarian system, which are less present in PR system. All right, so. Overall, you know, what we are reading of this is that, okay, all, we like those theories a lot, actually, uh, but um, they kind of uh, overlook the importance of the geographic distribution of voters and how this geographic distribution of voters matter differently under PR and MASH, right? So under MASH, you know, by definition, you need to win, as I explained, 50, at least 50% of the districts to win the majority in the National Assembly. And so, so you need, so you cannot, really targets a few districts, you need to target a minimum number of districts. You need to win, to gain votes in various places in the country, all right? Which kind of give you an incentive to spread your resources uh, all over the country. While in PR, right, if voters that are likely to uh, um, change their mind are all located in the same place, all right, you can go and, get, and try to get those voters. So you don't have geographical constraint under PR while you have under MASH. Right, and these theories overlook that, and what our theory is doing is uh, take that constraint seriously into account. So, in particular, um, what we do is to build a, a model of electoral competition with two key features. The first one um, is that government interventions are targetable at a finer level than the electoral district, which we are going to call localities. And the second. Um, key feature of the model is that these localities, they are heterogeneous in the sense that they may have different population size, uh, they may have different turnout rates, they may have different uh, swingness in the uh, meaning of the probabilistic voting model. All right, and so overall, they have different sensitivities, what we are going to call sensitivities, which is a compound of all these factors to electoral promises. All right, and so these two features allows us, allow us to uncover um, what we call the relative electoral sensitivity effect, which is only present in a majoritarian system, right? So what we find is that in PR, um, there are, the parties are going to target localities to allocate more resources to localities with higher sensitivities. So those who are large or have large turnout, who have high swingness, 
All right? Under Maj, they also do that, but now what matters is the relative sensitivity, all right? In comparison to the other localities in the same district, all right? And not in the whole, con in the whole uh, overall country, all right? And so that means that under Maj, the um, who are your neighbors is really important. So neighbors who are the neighboring localities in the same district is really important to, de to uh, determine your allocation. Right, and so uh, what we show, so we uncover that, that uh, ele relative electoral sensitivity effect, and then we explore how that affects the allocation of resources under comparatively under MAJ and PR, right? And we find, uh, for instance, that I will mention after, that um, it can lead to a lower uh, inequalities in government intervention in majoritarian system than in PR system. So kind of reversing the, uh, the common wisdom, all right? Um, what I forgot to mention um, is that Actually, there are two papers with um, two follow-up papers we've tested uh, or testing or uh, relative, the importance of a relative electoral sensitivity effect on uh, U.S. data and find that um, it's, it's, it, it matters. All right, it matters for the allocation of resources uh, from state to counties uh, in the U.S. All right, so it's not uh, only you know I want to convince you that it's not only a theoretical curiosity here. All right, and then no, can I ask you a question uh, sure. here? Uh, Heterogeneous localities, population size is exogenous, but turnout is endogenous, right? Or is it? So in the model, in the baseline model, it's it's going to be uh, exogenous, um, but we have an extension in which we endogenize it. Um, you know, being a voting theorist is not my <laughs> favorite version of an endogenous turnout model, but uh, we have something about that. So I don't think, um, yeah. So but my concern is only what is exogenous and endogenous, and in particular, these sensitivity effects. Do they as, do you assume them, or are they result of endogenous result of the model? Because they they depend on on those localities. So let me let me introduce the model, and then I'll I'll, sh I'll show you, um, oh, yeah. uh, and you. then we can talk we can talk more, right? And then finally, um, I won't have much time to do this today, but. Um, we uh, propose numerical simulations based um, to to assess the. Um, the potential effects of uh, different reforms of the electoral college in the US. Okay, and show how um, kind of what we want to do with that is highlight the importance of that relative electoral sensitivity effect for um, our predictions about what those uh, reforms would uh, would do to inequalities in government interventions and you know, who are the winners and losers of, uh, of uh, potential reforms. Okay, so, um, so the model, so we have, um, very, I would say, a very standard uh, um, uh, probabilistic voting model here, um, except for the two features I was mentioning. So, the economy is the following. So, we have a continuum of voters of size one. Um, there are L localities, which are indexed by L, and um, which size is denoted by NL. Okay, each locality belongs to an electoral district D. There are capital D of them, um, um, and. Um, voter consume, sorry, I'm distracted because I'm, read, I'm looking at the chat, which is a very bad idea. Um, and so um, what we have is that voters, they consume locality specific public resources denoted by Q. So Q, bold Q is a, a vector, which is just the uh, per capita amount of the uh, public resources um, uh, consumed by um, voters in locality one, locality two, locality L. Okay. Um, the preference are super standard, so, you know, Voters they like or indiv individuals they like um, they like the public resources, uh, but uh, the marginal uh, utilities uh, is decreasing. All right, and um, at the moment there are no spillovers across localities, and the utility functions are the same in all localities. And so the point here is that so is that any um, heterogeneity in the treatment treatment of locality is not going to be driven by uh, by differences in preferences. All right, so we are uh, abstracting for that. It's not that we cannot deal with it, but it just makes the presentation of the result uh, uh, cleaner. All right, and we have an extension with um, spillovers, but that's um, I won't have time for that. Um, um, all right, so what the government is doing is just to allocate a budget Y to the different localities. Um, and as I said, the targeting is at the final level that the electoral district, except in the special case in which there is one locality per district, which is what the typical um, the literature, like models in the literature typically cons uh, consider as a case. All right, and so I'm going to briefly talk about that uh, later. Um, in terms of cost, um, so this is our way, we, we use the cost function to capture um, um, different type of public uh, intervention or government in intervention. We can have that 
you know, this is the cost. So it's NL to the power alpha times QL. NL being, if you remember the size, the number of individuals in locality L. So if e alpha is equal to one, we are talking essentially about pure transfers. Um, if alpha is equal to zero, then we are talking about pure local public goods, right? So that's, um, so we cover, uh, uh, you know, anything in between that. Those two extreme cases. And so this is the budget constraint, um, nothing surprising there. All right. Um, okay, so let me start with the optimal allocation, which is kind of the politics free benchmark. Um, and here we are going to consider um, a social planner maximizing utilitarian, the utilitarian social welfare function. So the sum of utilities subject to the budget constraint. And what we find is just this condition, like very typical Samuelson condition, um, in which um, what you see here, so since u, since u is concave, all right, you have that the higher uh, NL, the better uh, locality L is going to be treated, all right? So the, the as, soon, as long as, you know, um, there is a bit of public good flavor in the public good intervention, right? So just consider alpha equals zero, so pure public good. So you have that the higher the population, the more resources that uh, locality is going to get, right? So you have vertical inequalities um, in the sense that different localities, localities with different population sizes may be treated differently in the optimal, are going to be treated uh, differently um, um, in the optimal allocation, but localities with the same size should be treated the same. Right? What's important here is that you see no effects of electoral districts or political characteristics that I've not even uh, introduced yet. All right, so you see it's only about the population size uh, here. Okay, so we can also, um, since I'm, we are going to talk about inequalities in government intervention, we need um, a measure of inequality. And so we are, uh, we have developed, uh, well developed, uh, we have adapted a welfare-based measure um, building on Atkinson. Um, and so we assume, what we do is to assume C CRA utility, all right, with rho being the um, uh, risk, in, risk aversion parameter. And, um, and so on, using that, we can define the equivalent budget all right, which is the budget that you need to reach the same utility as the one you reach under allocation Q, right? If you were to allocate resources optimally. Okay, so it's the minimum budget that you need to reach the same uh, social welfare as the one you uh, reach uh, with the allocation Q board. Okay, and uh, the Atkinson measure is just one minus the equivalent budget divided by Y, right? So you see that if the equivalent budget is the same as Y, so it means that the allocation is optimal, this is equal to one, so the measure of inequality is going to be zero. And it, when it increases, it means that there is more uh, inequality. Okay, so it's kind of a measure of the fin financial cost of political distortion. Right? Okay, so now for the politics. So, um, <clears throat> so we have two parties, A and B, and they make uh, budget allocation proposals, QA and QB. So what they do is to they make uh, um, common promises. They make promises and these promises are binding. So they, they say, I'm going to offer, you know, three to uh, locality one, four to locality three, and so on. Um, and their objective, the objective of the parties, the way they determine those allocation is uh, to maximize the expected number of seats in the National Assembly. All right, so I know that at this point you're saying, oh, what if uh, parties are instead maximizing the priority of winning a majority of seats? So we have an appendix in the paper showing that our uh, relative sensitivity effect is still there uh, when we do this, but the, uh, the math is um, not as nice and presentable. So it's, it's in the appendix, all right? Um, so what electoral systems are doing here is really just um, the differences between, the difference between the electoral system is just in the way they map votes into seats, all right? Under PR, the seats are attributed proportionally to a fraction of national vote. So we, we assume that it is as if there is one nationwide district. We still have the districts that, you know, that I mentioned before, the D district that I mentioned before, but they play no role right, in the baseline model, right? I see a question about that. Then we consider in an extension um, PR with districts, right? And we show uh, how things are uh, changing. There's still a relative sensitivity, you know, things are slightly different there. Um, but again, I won't have time to talk about that, except if you ask a question, obviously. Um, then under majoritarian systems, the seats are just proportional to the fraction of district one. So we have one seat per district 
districts are won by first past the post. And so if you win 10 districts, you have 10 seats in the National Assembly. Okay, that's the only difference between the two systems. Parties are the objective of the, there is no differences in the objectives of the party between the two systems. They want to achieve the same thing. So it's really this mapping of vote into seats that uh, changes. All right, so we have a pluralistic voting model in which turnout varies across locality, all right? And this is an exogenous parameter uh, uh, here. So TL is the turnout rate in district, uh, in locality L, sorry. So we can have a model. So all the results I'm going to present uh, today hold in a model in which um, voters have a cost of, vo of voting, all right? A, a, a heterogeneous cost of voting and um, they vote only if um, their uh, expected gain, utility gain from one party versus the other is larger than this expected, that this cost of voting. Okay, so um, that, that works too. So it's kind of the a way to endogenize uh, turnout in a prosthetic voting model. Um, all right, but then when voting, so voters either vote or not vote, um, don't vote. And when voting, individual I in locality L cast a ballot for A if and only if the utility differential of the party promises is larger than these two objects, right? Which are kind of uh, shocks, right? To the preferences of individuals. So what do we have here? We have that new is, um, is, is capturing the ideology of uh, individual I in locality L. So what you have to just have to think about um, is that we have um, within a locality, we have heterogeneous uh, individual, like individual with kind of heterogeneous preferences for A and B on top of their policy preferences, right? So some are really pro A, pro party A, some are really pro party B, and some are kind of indifferent. And that's captured by this, um, this uh, individual uh, ideology parameter, right? Which is distributed, well behaved and so on. The only thing that you need to um, uh, remember really the piece of notation that's going to matter is this phi L, which is the density of the distribution of uh, ideology, of the ideology distribution, okay? Um, then we have uh, this um, variable, which is uh, with this parameter. So, uh, so, so that's um, um, a district level popul popularity shock, right? So this is going to move all voters in all localities in district D in the same direction. So this is, you know, one, uh, like the head of a party pays only $750 in taxes, right? And that people don't like that. And so we are going to all to move in one direction or in, in, in the other. Right, so that's uh, that's the idea. We could have a national shock also, but that makes notation uh, the notation not not super cool. Um, so not super nice. So um, again, what you need to remember is this density uh, 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 notation. All right, so it's gamma d. Right, so that's what's going to matter here. Uh, so if you will remember anything from this slide, so it's this phi, which I'm, I will call swingness, and gamma, which I will call contestability. All right, a refined version of that is going to be called like that. Okay, so that's the structure, very typical pluralistic voting model. And so now with that, we can solve um, for the equilibrium allocation under uh, PR and under MAR. All right, so under PR, as I said, parties maximize the countrywide expected vote share subject to the aggregate budget constraint. Uh, and so we have that if an equilibrium exists, parties are converging and the allocation is implicitly defined by this, um, um, uh, this first order, the first order conditions. All right, so what you need to uh, see, like what's important here is that, okay, here is the marginal utility of QLA, the promise of party uh, A to locality L. Um, and the important parameter is that SL here, which is the, what we call the electoral sensitivity of like locality L, which depends on the turnout rate the number of individual in locality L, and uh, in this case, the expected density of swing voters in L, right? So the, the, the sorry, not swing voters, so voters in L, sorry, yes, the expected density of voters in L. Um, and, you know, it depends on this ideologic distribution of uh, uh, ideological parameters here. Um, and so what you see here is that because this is concave utility, when the sensitivity, electoral sensitivity increases, you have that, um, this must decrease and so QL is going to increase, all right? So, so localities with higher electoral sensitivities are going to be treated better under PR, right? Which is what this proposition is, is saying, right? Which the, the idea, just consider alpha equal zero, so it's simpler to interpret. Okay, so as I said, more sensitive localities receive a larger share of the budget under PR, all right? And importantly, you see that gamma D, this popularity shock, 
all right? This parameter, the, the density of the popularity shock doesn't play any role here under PR, right? It does not affect the allocation of resources under PR. Okay? So that's very kind of, there's nothing new here. Okay, so this is the, the, the traditional uh, result under PR. Oops, I managed to. Um, and then um, under Marge, um, we have that um, parties maximize the number of district one. Okay, so to win a district, you need your vote share in the district to be above 50%. And so we can show that in equilibrium, so if an equilibrium exists, um, then um, against the party are converging and the uh, allocation is uh, implicitly defined by those uh, set of uh, first order conditions. And see here you see some stuff that are the same as before. Some object, this was there before under PR, this was there and okay, the Lagrange Vinti player was there. Um, what is new are these two objects here, right? You have, what do you have? You have gamma hat DL, which is the um, density of um, the popularity shock, the district level popularity shock at the point at which uh, the district is tied, um, the, the two parties are tied in the district, all right? Which is, which is what we are going to call the contestability of the district. It's kind of intuitively is the probability that parties end up close to a tie in D. And so that an increase in the, pro, in the promise, in your promise to, that, uh, to a locality in that district is going to swing some voters to vote for you, all right? Convince some voters to vote for you and then swing the district from B to A. Right, so that's the uh, kind of priority that this happened, and, um, and roughly, and so, and then you have uh, this object, which is the sensitivity of the district of the locality divided by the sensitivity of the district. Okay, um, these are these objects. All right, and so, um, and so, this is what we call the relative sensitivity. Right, see how sensitive you are relative to all other uh, localities. Um, in, in, the, in your district, right? And so what you have is that the higher the contestability and the higher the relative sensitivity, the better locality uh, L is going to be treated, right? So we have this, uh, you know, this leads to this proposition is that in MAJ, a locality is better treated, locality L gets higher share of the budget than locality L prime, so more public good, if and only if it has a higher uh, contestability times relative sensitivity than the other lo the locality L prime. Okay, so here you have the typical effect that the contestability, so this is this battleground state kind of story that I was mentioning in the introduction, right? The more likely the, the district is, um, is to be close to 50%, the more likely the election in closing the district, the more parties will want to uh, throw resources at that district, right? What is new here is this relative electoral sensitivity effect, right? Is that now whether I treat uh, a locality. What matters is not that you know you are your your locality with voters with really high turnout. No, what matters is that your turnout is really high in comparison to the turnout of other localities in the in your district, right? And so you may have a very like kind of average turnout in the country, but your neighbors all have a low turnout in the country, and so your relative the turnout is really high, and that's going to attract a lot of resources, like give incentives to the parties to uh, target resources at that locality. Right, which means that the resources allocated to equality depend on the characteristic of the neighbors, not only your own characteristics, but also the, the characteristics of your neighbors. Right? Um, okay, so it gives me, let me give you an intuition about, try to give you the intuition about this. So this is more than an intuition, I would say is the kind of mechanism, really mechanism of what's happening in the, in, in, in the model here, all right, mathematically. Uh, so what's happening is that, um, okay, an increase in support for A in locality L affects the winner of the district if and only if that change in support is pivotal, right? Changes the outcome of the election from A getting less than 50% of the votes to A getting more than 50% of the votes. Um, and so what we have, it mean, what that means is that for a given increase in support, a given increase in support, there is a range of realization of the popularity shock in district D such that the change is pivotal. Essentially, the, pivot, the, pivot, the, the popularity shock has to be such that the district is very close to 50%. Close enough such that the change in vote, all right, is going to make the district uh, swing from one column to the other. And so the more likely delta D, so this popularity shock is to fall in that pivotal range, the better the locality is treated. 
right? So the, the question now is to understand what makes it likely that the locality, uh, that the, this uh, probability shock falls in the pivotal range, all right? And it depends actually on two factors. So the width of the pivotal rate range and the height of the pivotal range, right? So what affects the width and the, and the height of the pivotal range? So the width is determined by the relative sensitivity. You can understand that first, you know, if you could just consider the electoral sensitivity of the locality, if it's higher, it means that voters in that locality are more responsive to increase uh, in, in the utility, in the utility, so in the ch uh, change in promises. And so that, um, that this change, you know, this um, change of utility is going to lead to a change in uh, which party is winning the district for a wider range of shocks, right? And so that increases the width of the pivotal range. So a higher electoral sensitivity of locality L increases the width of the pivotal range. But we also have that a higher aggregate sensitivity of district D uh, means reduces the width of the pivotal range. Why? Because when you have a higher aggregate sensitivity, voters in the districts are more responsive, not only to, pro to electoral promises, but also to the shock, delta D. And so that means that the aggregate vote share in D is more unstable, which means that the range of values of delta such that uh, no, so that the, the change in utility is pivotal is, um, is, is smaller. Okay, Stina. Um, now, for the height of the pivotal range, it is determined by the district contest contestability. This is just the likelihood that the shock takes any of the values in the pivotal range. Right, so that's kind of, uh, hopefully gives you an intuition of, of uh, what's happening uh, here. So one um, important special case of this, um, of this proposition is when, the, when there is one locality per district, which is the typical case considered in the, in, in, in the literature. All right, so what you see is that if there is one locality per district, S hat L is equal to S hat D. So the sensitivity of the locality is equal to the sensitivity of the district, which means that the relative sensitivity is equal to one for all localities. Right, so this kind of this means that the 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 the, the, the sensitivity of the of the localities is completely disappearing from this, and anything the only thing that matters on for Maj is the differences in contestabilities, right? And this is why in the literature that's showing that's showing why in the literature the trade-off is really between contestability in Ma, in in Maj, right? So differences of, of treatment across localities is going to depend on the contestabilities of the district only, while in PR. It's the sensitivity that matter. Okay, my previous proposition, right? But what this looks to this does to some extent when we focus on this case is overlook the role of the relative sensitivity, right? So what I want to what we do here is to bring that and show kind of explore the importance of that uh, of the relative sensitivity effect and so the importance of subdistrict targeting essentially. All right, so to do that, to compare the systems, um, I'm going to make some simplifying assumption. Um, one is that alpha is going to be equal to zero now. Uh, it's not very important for the result, but just simplify the, um, the presentation. So we are, you, have, you have to have in mind locality level, pure public goods. Um, and we assume that uh, the individual and district shocks are uniformly distributed. All right, so we have that now the new is distributed uniformly with parameter phi L. So phi L now becomes a swingness, like this is what I call the swingness. And uh, you know, it's just, it's the same, the phi bar and phi hat are the same now. So that simplifies our life a lot. And then the district specific shock is distributed uh, again, uh, according to um, uniform with kind of uh, a potential uh, bias in the uniform and gamma D being the contestability parameter. All right, so this is really, this affects the sensitivity. So how many votes you are um, going to uh, uh, gain by increasing your promise to a locality. Okay, the higher that parameter, the more votes you get. And uh, Gamma D is telling you how likely the election is to be uh, close to 50% in the district, All right? And so um, how likely it is that a change in vote share in that district is going to um, affect the identity of the winner. Okay, so um, the first thing um, <clears throat> I want to uh, highlight is that, you know, when we, take into account the relative sensitivity seriously. So when we allow for um, um, sub-district targeting, right, you can have that um, who is winning or losing from a, a PR to MAJ reform is, uh, is affected. All right, so just let me uh, consider a numerical example here with four localities and two districts. 
we have CRA utility with a, a row the uh, risk aversion parameter um, equal to one half. And we have two different cases in terms of electoral contestability. One in which the two districts um, have the same electoral contestability, so the same gamma, um, and one in which uh, A is much more likely to be contestable, is much more contestable than B. All right, so here I realized I realized that uh, I realized on Friday and I, but I didn't change it because I cannot change all my tables, but this is very bad notation to call them A and B. This has nothing to do with the parties. All right, so these are independent from the parties, but okay, that's life. So here, okay, so we have two district, uh, two district A and B, two localities in each district. So localities one and two are in district A, three and four are in district B, and we have the sensitivities of those localities. So locality one has a, has a sensitivity of one, Locality two has a sensitivity of two, two and two, five, okay? And so here in this column, you have the location under PR. The first thing you need to see, I want you to notice is that, you know, as the proposition is saying, the, um, the treatment of a locality depends on its sensitivity. So the more sensitive you are, the more, the higher the share of resources you are, uh, of the budget you are getting. Okay, you see that. And so this means that, no matter who are your neighbors, if you have a sensitivity of two, you're going to be treated the same way, right? The same is not true under MASH. So this is the case and the allocation under MASH for the same contestability of the district, like district with the same contestability. And you see now that it's not only about the sensitivity, right? There are other things that get in the way. And in particular, in this example, the thing that gets in the way is the relative sensitivity. So now locality two is, as a, you know, the same sensitivity as locality three, but has a much higher relative sensitivity than locality three because the neighbor of two has a low sensitivity while the neighbor of three has a high sensitivity. And so because of that, you have that locality two is much better treated uh, than locality three. Okay, and then, um, um, and then what you see here, when you move from this column to this column, you see the effect of contestability, which is now one district, district A, is much more contestable than district B. So parties realize, okay, we are much more likely with an offer to change the identity of the winner here. And so that gives them the incentives to put a lot of, most of the resources actually in uh, that district. Okay. Okay, so now we can, um, um, explore um, the effect of the system on inequality in government interventions or the comparable effect, comparative effects. And so we used our Atkinson measure that I've already introduced. Um, and in particular, I'm going to say that PR Atkinson dominates MAJ if PR generates less inequality than MAJ. All right. Uh, the allocation under PR is uh, less unequal. Like, okay, so there are lower socially inefficient inequalities, all right? And that's, that's, that's important here. All right, so let's go back to the previous example. Um, and here now to say something about um, inequalities or inefficient inequalities, I need to tell you something about um, where, what's the population size of these different localities. So here I'm going to consider two cases. So let's say that the four locality, localities have identical turnout and swingness, which means that differences in sensitivity are fully driven by differences in population sizes, right? So in particular, you have that this locality, locality one is much smaller, much uh, yeah, smaller in population than locality four, right? And so um, what you have here is that, okay, the, the optimal allocation is saying, okay, we should treat much better the localities with the higher sensitivity because it's all driven by population size. So we should treat better uh, large, large localities and uh, not as well uh, uh, small localities, which is exactly what's happening under PR. The allocation is actually the optimal allocation, while it's not what's happening under MASH where there are distortions. And you see that these distortions are, uh, you know, this is the distortion due to only to the, contest the differences in aggregate uh, relative sensitivity. And these ones are, uh, you are adding those that are due to, uh, driven by differences in contestability. Okay, so you see that here PR Atkinson dominate MASH, low, less inequalities under PR than MASH. Now, if I assume that the four localities have identical population size, so it means that all differences in sensitivities across localities are driven by differences in turnout and or swingness. Okay, so in that case, we have that, um, we have that MASH could be Atkinson dominating PR. In particular, if there are no differences in contestability, then 
match is going to Atkinson dominate PR, while if there are big differences in contestability, then we still have that uh, PR is Atkinson dominating match. So you see that by, um, yeah, that's, um, now we can have a reversal of this common, uh, common wisdom that um, uh, PR, you know, PR generate less inequalities in government intervention than MASH, right? So that's uh, what I wanted to illustrate here. So obviously we would like to have, um, oh, we would like to have a more, a more general comparison here and um, kind of being able to identify uh, conditions on the parameters of the, of the model such that PR Atkinson dominate MASH or MASH Atkins, uh, Atkinson dominate PR. So uh, that's not easy. So uh, we uh, struggle a lot with this. And so we are only able to say something general for, which is going to sound weird, for specific cases, <laughs> all right? So uh, we can identify um, a condition for specific cases. So in particular, uh, for con when we uh, make some assumptions about the, the size of the district, which, has to, which have to be the same, all right? And uh, if we want to consider any CRA utility function, then it would be, uh, we'd have to also add one look that there is only one locality per district, right? Which kind of a bit defeat the purpose of what we want to achieve here. But we, in those cases, we can show that if gamma D over the sum of gamma D is a means preserving spread of SD over the sum of SD, uh, then PR Atkinson dominate Maj and the opposites when uh, the opposite is true. All right, which is saying it's just a comparison. So if you want to understand for those specific case, um, the system that generate more in like, PR is going to generate more inequalities if the spread in electoral sensitivities across district is uh, broader than the spread of uh, incontestabilities across district and the opposite. All right, and that's kind of, you know, a useful result to some extent because it kind of helps interpreting what's, what you see in the literature. So if you note Stromberg's paper is looking at um, uh, the effect of replacing the electoral, electoral college by the national popular vote, right, which is essentially a move from a modified version of MASH to PR. And he finds that uh, this would lead to a decrease in cross-state inequalities in campaign resources, right? And indeed, this is what actually is considering one of those specific cases because he has one locality per district. Um, and indeed for the election he looks at, the cross-state differences in contestability are much bigger than the, the, the cross-state differences in sensitivity. So this is exactly in line with what our, pr our proposition is, is saying here. Yes, for those elections, because you have this, this comparison between uh, the spread and contestability and spread in sensitivities, you get uh, that outcome. Now it's also telling you that if you were to look at other elections in which this comparison is flipped, you should get the flipped conclusion, right? That's the first thing uh, that we are saying here. More importantly, we say, okay, this is only for this specific case that are essentially abstracting from the role of, from the impact of sub-district targeting, right? So district, so targeting at a level smaller than the district, finer than the district. And so what I want to illustrate now uh, uh, is to what, it's what's happening when we allow for this sub-district targeting. And so I want to highlight two things. I'm going to go very fast because I want to talk a little bit um, um, about the uh, numerical example, like the numerical simulations. But what we can show here is first that um, same example as before, all right? And we add two columns in which we um, have the uh, allocation when parties can only target at the district level. So you see that all localities in a given district are treated the same. So what's happening when you allow for sub-district targeting, obviously you create, you allow for within district inequalities. Right, and what we show in this example, what this example is showing, is just that when you take those within district inequalities into account, that can flip the conclusion about which system generate more inequality. So, in particular, if I in this example, if I'm looking at district level targeting, PR Atkinson dominate MASH, so less inequalities under PR than MASH. But if um, I allow for sub-district targeting, so locality level targeting, I have that actually Maj Atkinson dominates PR, so more inequalities under PR, right? So um, I don't have time to explain why this is the case exactly, but uh, I just want to highlight that this can happen. And then uh, the second thing um, is that um, we can find examples in which um, a district would be uh, predicted to be a winner with district level targeting, but is predicted to be a loser uh, when you have uh, sub-district targeting, right? And so that's what this example is, is uh, highlighting and I'm, I'm going to skip it because I want I have five minutes left now. So that's the, 
Yes, I just wanted <laughs> yeah. I meant to, yeah. Actually, I would just to talk about these uh, numerical simulations. Um, so what we do is to study possible reforms of the electoral college. And so we have to, ex so the first thing we do is to extend our theoretical model to accommodate for first the electoral college, which is a weighted version of, um, of a, majority, a majority that we have seen so far, majoritarian system we have seen, and also um, uh, to consider various version of PR, all right? So, um, and then we, okay, calibration is a bad word. So we use data, we feed US data to our model, and then uh, we make, and we see what the, we talk about, you know, discuss the predictions um, that our model delivers. Not really, there's not much calibration in there. Uh, so it's a bit of a, too much of a word. So just what's the, I guess you all know what the electoral college is. So in the US, the, uh, the, the uh, winner of the presidential election is the candidate that obtains uh, a majority of votes in the electoral college, right? And, and a majority of electors, all right? And what's happening is that the election takes place at the state level. Right, so each state is going to um, send ele like to um, is a certain number of electors. So California has a certain number of electors represent depending on the number of representative in the um, in Congress that California has and the number of senators. All right, and so candidates compete in California. The candidate that obtains the largest number of votes in California is going to get all the electors from California. All right, so that's how it works. Um, so it's a weighted version of, um, uh, of MAJ, as I said. And then we are considering two potential reform, uh, the national popular vote, which is we can show is exactly equivalent to PR. So this is just a system in which you win the election if you win more than 50% of the votes over the country, right? So no matter where they're coming from. And then we have also uh, a version of the electoral college in which the electors, electoral votes, all right, are uh, allocated proportionally to the vote share within each state, all right? And I'm not going to say much about this. All right, so um, that's the theory. Everything the same as before under the electoral college as in MAJ, except that we have this weight omega D, which is the number of seats you have in the electoral college, all right? And so the larger that number, the better you are, uh, your, uh, like the, the larger the, n the number of seats associated to the district the locality is in, the better the locality is going to be treated, okay? so. And we still have that contest the contestability matter and the relative sensitivity matter. Okay, that I'm skipping because um, I'm, not, I'm not going to talk about that. So, okay, so um, for the um, numerical simulations, what we need to do is first to match the model and the US political and administrative structure. Um, and so what we have is that we are going to have the, the districts in our model are going to be the states in the US and the localities are the counties, right? So in our data set, we have 48 states, and uh, more than 3,000 3, uh, counties. All right, we have um, 10 presidential election between uh, 1980 and 2016, um, and we need proxy variables for key, for key variables. So I think the only one I want to talk about is our measure of contestability. All right, and here, um, you know, for the other measures, kind of the typical measure in the literature, uh, here there's more debate. And so we have two measures, one measure, which is just one minus the victory margin in the district, Right, which is a typical measure used. Um, and the other is kind of based on the work of Stromberg. I don't have time to explain exactly. It's a complicated process to get it because we need to fit, extrapolate, whatever. Um, but what's important is that this kind of look more like the contestability measure in Stromberg. And what's happening is that this one is much more skewed than this measure. The distribution, you know, you have much bigger differences in contestabilities using the Stromberg-like measure than using the other measure. Right, so that's all you need to uh, all you need to know. I guess that me, you know, maybe the truth well, is either nowhere or in the middle. Um, so depending on how, how much you believe those measures. All right. So, um, okay, I don't have time to say much. I have, I have one minute left. All right. So, uh, what you see, I'm going to say two things. Um, first, we can predict okay the allocation of resources. So here on the uh, x-axis you have the log of the sensitivity, and on the y-axis you have the log of QL, which is the allocation to uh, uh, locality L. What you see, first, the relationship is log linear in SL. And actually, a ton of the variation in location is driven by variation in SL that we find. The, um, but there are, um, and, but what I want you to look at is, more interestingly, is if you fix an SL, what you see is that under the electoral college and the proportional version of the electoral version of the electoral college, you have that two localities that have the same sensitivity 
can be treated differently. Under the national popular vote, that would never happen because all that matters is the sensitivity, while under the electoral college, you have those differences, and those differences come from what? The contestability, the aggregate sensitivity, and the electoral weight of the, of, uh, of the, of the district, right? That's one thing. The second thing, and then I'm done. Um, okay, we have those, we can compute winners and losers of a reform from the electoral college to the national popular vote, right? And the typical thing that the typical kind of trade-off here that people would use to explain this is to say, okay, depends on, you know, if you have a, if you're highly contestable or if you are um, uh, under apportioned, right? You are likely to be, a, you will be a winner if you are uh, of that reform of a move to the national popular vote. And indeed you have like California, low contestability and, uh, uh, vastly under underrepresented in the electoral college, so it would be a big winner of a reform. Same thing for you know New York, let's say. While Florida, on the other hand, or as Arizona, are a very contestable states, and so they would lose a lot from that reform. Right. So that would be the typical explanation. Um, but there are differences that you cannot explain here. Take Illinois and Texas. Right. They have um, Illinois, and Texas. They have the same contestability and malapportionment to some extent. If you look along that dimension, which is this graph, and then I'm, I'm done, um, you have on this x-axis, you have gamma d, the contestability, and omega d divided by nd, which is a measure of malapportionment. And you see that Illinois and Texas, they are essentially the same according to that measure, but still we, have, we predict that Texas would be one of the biggest losers in this um, uh, of a reform from the electoral college to the national popular vote, uh, while Illinois would be one of the, uh, the biggest winner. Okay, why? Because of differences on the y-axis, which is or the aggregate sensitivity, All right? It's because Texas has a low aggregate sensitivity and Illinois has a high aggregate sensitivity that um, uh, Texas is a big uh, loser and Illinois is a big winner. Right, and so all these differences between state on the y-axis, on the y-dimension, as is essentially what we are, what or taking to account the relative sensitivity effect, and you know, target, targeting at the sub-district level is allowing us to explain. Right, so um, then we have a, a ton of other stuff, but um, um, I don't have time. So, uh, you know, I'm done. Thank you very much. Um... Yes, we saw 70, 70 uh, slides, but, but you, you did a uh, you know, great job. Um, so let's move to the Q&A questions. We have, we have two questions. Uh, Arthur Silva, do you, have, uh, do you want to follow up? Because there is uh, some was answered, but some, some wasn't. Hi, Laurent. Uh, great paper. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to yeah. definitely read the details of the math. Uh, it looks uh, extremely interesting also in the details, so I'm going to go back to this. I have uh, two questions and they're not exactly those that were in the, in, the, um, in the chat. The first might be more a suggestion for an extension uh, because it adds a layer of complexity. Uh, what happens if you have some redistricting in the middle? So uh, there might, uh, that might attenuate a bit the difference between majoritarian and proportional representation. I'm not exactly sure how that would play out, but you might have maybe something to say here if you add that layer of complexity. Not very interesting because I think your paper is already very big at this point. So maybe it's just another idea. One thing that I would like to see, and maybe you have that in the slides you did not show us, is in your prediction of the losers and the winners uh, of the electoral reform in the US, could you match this to maybe a behavior of the legislators of the different representatives of the different states on the reform to, to show whether there is at least some heuristic in their mind that, there, that they would be losers or winners under the reform and that this reflects into their uh, behavior in the Senate and in the House. That would, that would be great. I mean, you have obviously a complex model. I am sure that no one in their parties have theorized what you're saying. And if they're still have, they still have that in mind, that would be cool. Yeah. So sh should I take more questions or answer? No, let's keep going because we, we, we can continue as much as you want and then we'll just stop recording at a certain point. Okay, go so, on. so on the redistricting, so I don't know how, um, how, the, how that would affect exactly our results. Um, what we are doing now um, is 
I think we, we're working on a gerrymandering paper in which we take into account uh, the relative sensitivity effect, right? Okay. And that's that's something that we are doing. Uh, so I would love to say that we had started recently, and this is why we don't have results. So we didn't we started not that recently, but we still don't have many results <laughs> uh, um, that I can report back. Okay. Uh, but um, but yeah, so uh, there, there are stuff happening there. There is there are some. Uh, interesting implications of the relative sensitivity effect for the strategic uh, drawing of uh, uh, of district borders um, and so yeah so hopefully we can um, um, and we have actually I'm lying we, we have some predictions and we have we, it's also an empirical paper and uh, I would say that we have some support uh, um, you know preliminary results are encouraging let's say so there are some interesting thing there uh, then in terms of um, whether you know our prediction of who is a winner who is a loser uh, is in line with the support for uh, potential reforms all right so for instance you might have heard of the uh, interstate the national popular vote interstate compact uh, which is uh, a, like uh, an initiative now in the us uh, which um, it's a state level initiative um, that would uh, essentially um, make the electoral college uh, um, uh, irrelevant Right, so it's states committing to uh, uh, allocate their electoral votes, the electors, based on the result of the national popular vote. Right, and so that kind of gives us um, an idea of which state is supporting uh, a move to the national popular vote and which state is uh, against it. And so I, I thought we had that in the paper, but I'm not finding it just right now. But um, you know, we have there is some correlation between uh, gain predicted gain in our model and a vote in favor of that uh, reform, uh, but it's not perfect, right? In the sense that we have some states who we who, uh, which we predict would lose and then voted in favor, and some states uh, which we predict would uh, gain, uh, which uh, voted again. So it's not perfect, but there is, you know, the, you know, Florida has not voted in favor of that, uh, <laughs> of that, uh, none of the battleground state, I think, has voted in favor of that, um, uh, of that reform. All right. Um, so I think also well, there are two things. First, you know, like there is this. Uh, this is not the only price, no. So like kind of distributive politics here is not the only price that you would gain. So getting having the president is something that um, and there is more to it than just what we are saying. I think in determining um, uh, who is going to adopt that that reform. But so, yeah. Right. Th thanks for now, um, Kirill. Do you want to ask a question or? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi. Hi, Laurent. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. I just have a quick clarifying question. So you mentioned the uh, statements regarding the existence of the equilibrium and all of the comparisons assume that the equilibrium exists. And I mean, under the standard um, probabilistic voting model, you would get it automatically, I suppose. But I was still wondering if you uh, impose some of the uh, restrictions uh, on the sensitivity because uh, you can imagine that for example if you cannot fully offset uh, the um, the pivotality effect then you would not have a symmetric equilibrium there so there must be some assumptions um, under this yeah so um, so two and two layered answer <laughs> so we have um, um, so when we assume uniform distribution then we can pin down exactly the condition on the map, the parameter of those distributions such that we have an equilibrium. Um, and then we are kind of, um, you know, I can, you know, it's just, a, it's just a matter of this, you know, stuff have to be like the uniform has to be broad enough and the support has to be broad enough, essentially. Um, when and we don't do that- I was curious about, so how, how broad enough that has to be, because, uh, you know, if you match this to the uh, empirical um, results and you yeah so the, so you say that um, okay okay so um, okay two things there, here I think there is, there is a theory question and then there is a numerical simulation question um, I think the theory question so for uniform we can do it properly uh, when we assume very general uh, uh, distribution of those shocks uh, we are just saying like you know we need the utility uh, function to be concave enough and <laughs> we cannot say much more that, that we know that there are issues there if there are you know and and, and we don't do much about it um, now on the numerical side I think we are very um, uh, we are fine here because um, 
in a sense, your fear, if I understand well, is that is to say, you know, North Dakota is never going to be Democrat. So why would you, so essentially is not the contestability of North Dakota, you know, it's, why would you put money there? Because in any case, you, you are never going to win this, right? Yes. I think that um, here, our contest, we have a lot of flexibility on our contestability parameter. Uh, all right, and so we can have that, essentially the, the contestability of North Dakota is extremely small, right? Which is actually the case in the, <laughs> in the data. And, and then the, the parties are essentially allocating zero. Uh, to North Dakota, so that we can accommodate uh, easily. We can also have a model. We also had uh, in a previous version of the paper, we had uh, districts that were uh, not contestable at all. So we had this kind of you can be contestable, not contestable, and for those that are contestable, we have heterogeneity in the gamma, uh, and uh, you just had that those districts that were not contestable were receiving zero uh, uh, in the allocation of resources. So I think on the numerical simulation side, I'm not too, we, are, we have enough flexibility to accommodate for that. Uh, and yeah. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so we are going to stay uh, for more discussion and, and, and talk, but let's just officially uh, 